So the way the United States uh, police officers and uh, other civilized countries handle crime is a little different. Um, here in the United States, we like to shoot people. We like to shoot them dead. Pretty much. So America has a pretty perverse obsession with guns. You see this reflected in many situations where, for example, people are always paranoid that their house will get broken into, so they stockpile weapons. There's regular shootings in projects, drive-bys, and over-militarized police. There's a reason and a history as to why the American police are so much like the military. In the 1980s, police in America looked more like this. The U.S.'s crime rate had been doing this, and President Reagan called for the military to work more directly with the police for the war on drugs. Drugs are menacing our society. We must move to strengthen law enforcement activities. Congress agreed, and over the next few years passed a series of bills to give police access to military bases and equipment, for the National Guard to assist police with drug operations, for the military and police to train together, and eventually to have the military loan police departments their excess leftover equipment for free. This would become known as the 1033 program. Police departments got assault rifles like M16s, armored trucks, and even grenade launchers. And before long, it started to have an effect on how police police. We can see that in the number of times SWAT teams were used. Departments that had deployed them about once a month in the 80s were using them more than 80 times a year by 1995. Almost all of these deployments were for drug-related search warrants usually forced entry searches called no-knock warrants. A no-knock warrant was how Breonna Taylor was wrongfully murdered by a police officer in March of 2020, which, by the way, nobody has still been charged for that murder. In 1997, there was an incident in LA involving two armed robbers trying to rob a bank, and they had on uh, full body armor and automatic rifles. And the police did not have these things, so there was 12 officers that were injured. Right. And then that led to police departments all over the country demanding uh, body armor and assault rifles. And that same year, the 1033 program was expanded, dropping the requirement that police departments use the equipment for drug-related enforcement. Now any law enforcement, even university police, could access leftover military weapons for any reason. A retired police chief in Connecticut told the New York Times, I was offered tanks, bazookas, anything I wanted. And they use this equipment any chance that they get, even when it's completely unnecessary. Meanwhile, hospital workers are struggling to get personal protective equipment in the middle of a pandemic while the police officers have riot gear during peaceful protests. A police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, had shot and killed an unarmed black teenager, Michael Brown. Afterwards, the community's protests were met by heavily militarized police who pointed sniper rifles at them as they marched. Tear gas and armored tanks became a familiar sight in Ferguson, Missouri. By 2018, the armored trucks and gear was going from the military to smaller police departments, and the larger cities were just buying their own gear and equipment because they could afford to. It became a way that they see themselves as soldiers and that they can't do their job without that equipment. I ask officers, you know, do you have any problem with police officers routinely on patrol carrying military grade equipment or dressing in military type of uniforms? And the vast majority of those officers told me, no, I have no problem with that. And then the second question I asked is, do you think it changes the way that officers feel about themselves and their role in policing? And the vast majority of officers again said, yes. And what they said was it makes them more aggressive, more assertive, and it can make them more violent. And then finally, I asked them, how do you think the public perceives you? And the vast majority said it scares them. They know that it scares the public. They know that it makes them more aggressive or more assertive, and that could be dangerous, but they don't seem to care. And I'm not saying that there's no point in time where police officers and SWAT need to access that those weapons, but those times are few and far between. What is the police officer going to do with an assault rifle when he's facing a protest? You know, it, seriously, when you give someone a hammer, why are you surprised that everything looks like a nail to them? So these officers are very much aware that they appear and act threatening and that they escalate a dangerous or a not dangerous situation just by being present. They're supposed to bring safety and peace the situations and they bring intimidation and violence instead. And why do they act this way? 
well, let's take a look at their training. We can take a look at how other first world countries run their police forces and training programs compared to America. In Germany, for example, part of their training includes confronting their dark past and addressing their wrongdoings. It includes personally hearing Holocaust survivor stories and physically going to concentration camps. And this changes them emotionally and it creates empathy for the people that they're going to be serving. It teaches them to have respect for other people and I think America can learn something from that. So in Germany, first of all, the training is much longer. Uh, trainees go through at least two and a half, if not three years of, of training. And that training is really in depth on legal issues, but also on issues of democracy, uh, sociology, knowing the communities that they're policing uh, from, you know, whether they're communities of color or you know, there's a whole Russian communities here, making sure that they are founded and, and have a good solid grounding in the people that they will be responsible for. And then at, at the same time, there's a real emphasis on de-escalation. If you're a policeman in Berlin, you, it's very likely you're going to wind up on the front lines of some kind of a demonstration, and the police do get targeted. Uh, they get targeted with bottles, with stones. But at some point, they realized that pushing back too hard was actually not the way to bring about a more peaceful situation. And so the, the emphasis has really been on how to respond in a situation to keep even two violent groups, the left and the right, uh, from attacking each other when you have political protesters out in the street, and at the same time, uh, ensuring that the police themselves also remain safe so that they can protect the other people you know, who are living in, the, in these communities. On average, American police spend about 19 weeks in training, and this training has not changed much within the past 25 years. About 25% of that time is spent on de-escalating tactics, while the rest of it, the majority of it, is spent on what to do when there's conflict, how to protect yourself, how to fire, aim your weapon. You're basically teaching these officers how to have power over other people and how to see the regular citizens as criminals. And sometimes these officers only have a high school education and they come from very biased, maybe racist backgrounds. From the history of court cases involving police officers that have been charged for murder, they know that they're only gonna get away with a slap on the wrist. They'll get administrative leave, if anything, and that's just a vacation for them. Or they'll get switched to a different department. Even if they happen to be caught on camera, with evidence that they were murdering an innocent civilian. And on top of that, you have the blue coat of silence, which means none of your coworkers can tell on you or go against you. So if you happen to be a good cop that sees corruption within the force and you go and tell on them to a higher authority, you get looked at as a traitor, like it's a big frat house or something. So we put these police reforms in place like body cameras and duty to intervene, but they have not been effective and they just add to the police budget. The police are not heavily monitored. Who is policing the police? In the case of Minneapolis, since 2016, their police officers have received body cameras, bias training, and have a duty to intervene policy where other police officers must step in if they see force applied inappropriately. Yet, a Minneapolis police officer killed George Floyd as three officers looked on. In the UK, only about 2% of officers are armed and most of them just carry um, a taser or pepper spray. Okay, so from the top to bottom, we have our PR, our radio, communicating with each other and to control. Um, we've got a body worn video. I'm carrying a taser, which is um, about 400 officers currently in Kent are carrying. Parva, which is a pepper spray, um, which all officers carry. Um, the ASP button, rigid handcuffs, and then these are fast straps. So if someone's being particularly un unmanageable, um, these Velcro straps can be placed around their their legs just to make them so the most noticeable thing obviously he's going to have is his firearm, his sidearm. These are a Glock 9mm semi-automatic handgun. In addition to that, he'll have his impact weapon, his baton, latex gloves, combat tourniquet to be able to use on civilians or fellow officers or, or himself for that matter. He carries a Leatherman multi-tool, handcuffs, spare magazines for his sidearm, his taser, his radio, and an individual first aid kit, which is again, another gunshot wound and severe bleeding prevention kit. I have a secondary firearm here. Could you imagine going on patrol either without your firearm or your taser? No, not Why at all. Why not? 
uh, the job we do is extremely dangerous and unpredictable. To go out there unarmed is, is insane to me. In the UK, officers don't have anything like that. The best they have is a pepper spray. Would you be prepared to police the streets of London like that? What would you say to those guys and women who do it in London? I, I give them in, a lot in the whole of England, actually, sorry. I give them a lot of credit for doing what they do without the, the, the weapons and tools that we have here. I don't think I'd be a police officer over there, essentially going at the mercy of the wolves. Captain, could you imagine sending your officers out without a taser, without a firearm of some sort? I would sooner go out without shoes than I would without, without the kit like that. Like Did you see how scared those New Jersey cops were at the thought of patrolling without their guns? Like, there's no way to deal with a violent person unless you're able to kill them immediately. So let's take the guns out of the equation and I'll present you with the same scenario. First, uh, we're going to show you a video from the, uh, a terrorist attack in the UK over the weekend. This guy's already cut two people up. There's a ton of blood on the ground when the police come uh, and this is what happens. So uh, they did taser him. The first taser didn't work. Uh, the second one did. They kick away the knife. They arrest him. They didn't shoot him with guns. They didn't execute him. Wow. That's amazing, right? They didn't immediately kill him. Now, let's talk uh, about U.S. cops and let's show you a videotape there. Over the weekend, same uh, time period, here in the U.S., in Miami, there was a bank robber uh, who had a blade just like that guy had a blade. Let's see how that turned out. Yeah, dead. Unlike the UK terrorist, he had not stabbed anyone and was not lunging towards the police. The UK terrorist started lunging at the police, they still didn't shoot him. Okay? In our case, he's just standing there, the cops execute him on the spot. And in case you're not getting my point, police should not have guns. Taser, sure. Pepper spray, have at it. But the officers that are allowed to carry guns should be maybe two or three percent of the ones that are allowed now. In Ireland, they have dealt with domestic terrorism, so there is violence there. And still, only one quarter of their officers are armed. Uh, first of all, American police in 2014 were 18 times more lethal than Danish police. Well, that's got to be a high. I mean, the Danish police are probably uh, really, really placid. There's probably no crime there. How about uh, Finland? That's got to be lower, right? No. Uh, U.S. cops are 100 times more lethal than Finnish police. A lot of times in America, it happens to be uh, blacks and Latinos that get killed. They are overrepresented in the number of people killed by cops. They are most especially overrepresented in unarmed people killed by cops. But even if you take that huge percentage out, and you just talk about white people killed by cops in America, get a load of this. White Americans are 26 times more likely to die by police gunfire than Germans. It's not, oh, well, you know, those European countries, are, uh, they're all the same race. You know what I'm saying, wink, wink. Uh, so uh, that's why they don't have to do anything. No, 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 our white people get shot a lot more too. It's because our cops are trigger happy. Let's go to the uh, UK and do comp comparison here. Fatal shots by U.S. police since 2013 when someone is wielding a blade uh, or other weapons, but not, uh, a, not a gun, okay? More than 575 people killed, okay, uh, by U.S. cops since 2013. In the U.K., there's uh, more people who wield knives because of tight gun control. They have less guns, so more knives. So uh, the U.K. cops obviously must have killed more than 575 because there's so much more of it over there. Here's how many they killed since 2013, people attacking with a knife. One. Us, 575. U.K., one. Okay, speaking of the U.K., now let's uh, not just talk about knives, but all police killings uh, as of this year, okay? In the UK, police have killed one person uh, this year as of September 1st. In the US, we've killed 776 in that same time period. Even when the civilians just have knives, they're still being shot to death at a frightening rate. At this point, it might as well just be mass executions, but we need them to keep us safe, right? We need to throw our tax dollars at them to give them weapons to be able to kill us, right? 
So the defund the police movement started this summer of 2020. There's been some controversy around the slogan defund the police because it's pretty vague and it just rubs some people the wrong way. My English major background makes me think that the reason why defund the police isn't as effective as they probably want it to be is because you're using a negative statement as a way to bring people together and make change, but that doesn't really work. You have to use positive statements about saying what you want rather than what you don't want. So defund is a negative word because the D, it means take money away from, but instead they could have said redistribute funds or fund social services, something positive. Maybe it's not as catchy, I guess, I don't know. The goals of defund the police differ depending on the advocate that you speak to, which also makes it more confusing for people. Some say that the point of the movement is to take money away from police and then distribute it amongst other areas that help the community that are more preventative measures. And others say that they want to just abolish the police altogether. The U.S. spends $100 billion every year on policing most of which comes from local municipalities. New York City, for example, appropriated $5.9 billion last year to the police department. For comparison, here's what the city allocated for homeless services, health, housing, youth and community development, and jobs programs. The disparities are huge and they echo in cities across the country. Like in Chicago, where the policing budget is $1.7 billion, roughly twice the budget of the fire department, Department of Transportation, public library, and public health combined. Even in response to the pandemic, while many agencies grapple with coronavirus budget cuts, police budgets have largely remained intact. New York City's proposal for the coming fiscal year cuts just 5% of the NYPD budget, but that same proposal calls for a 12% cut to the Department of Health. This is where the movement to defund the police comes in. It's a push to take the billions of dollars cities spend on police and move that funding to other services, like housing, jobs, or mental health care. Police currently serve as this kind of catch-all for society's problems, which they're not trained for. They're doing too many jobs and none of those jobs they're doing particularly well. The police arrest over 10 million people in a year, and the vast majority of those arrests, especially in Black and poor neighborhoods, are for minor offenses like drug possession or drinking in public. That heavy-handed approach is over-policing. But when it comes to violent crime, the rate of police arrests is incredibly low. And that's under-policing, which leaves communities of color underserved. In France, they have specialized police units that focus on one specific area. That way they're not being spread too thin and they can focus on the one thing that they need to do. So every societal failure, we put it off on the cops to solve. Not enough mental health funding. Let the cop handle it. Not enough drug addiction funding. Let's give it to the cops. Schools failed. Give it to the cops. Policing was never meant to solve all those problems. 1.7 million students are in schools with police, but no counselors. And 3 million have police in schools, but no nurses. And when it comes to 911 calls, in many cases, police officers are the first responders to mental health-related emergencies. That's important because one in every four deaths from police shootings are people with mental health problems. People that are dealing with mental health issues, they don't need to be dealing with the police. They need social workers, psychiatrists, crisis intervention specialists. There's already a couple cities across America that are putting programs like this in place. Eugene, Oregon and Denver, Colorado. In Eugene, Oregon, there's a program called Cahoots. They've been around for the past 30 years and they send out mental health specialists to 911 calls instead of the police. There's a guy on River Rose who I think would benefit from uh, having Cahoots come visit him. When a mental health related 911 call comes in, Royal Avenue. a specialized team in Eugene, Oregon rolls out. Pretty much everybody we see is, for one reason or another, in a state of crisis. Manning Walker is a medic, and Laurel Lasovskis is a mental health crisis manager. The pair are members of CAHOOTS, crisis assistants helping out on the streets. 
They answer calls like suicide interventions and overdoses. They're unarmed and most of the time without police backup. We always yes. move as a team. Whoever is talking and making contact, the other person is observing. Cahoots was founded in 1989. Last year, they responded to nearly 23,000 calls in Eugene and Springfield, Oregon. Denver is starting their own version of Cahoots. City leaders from Oakland, Olympia, Washington, and even New York City are all considering similar pilot programs. Tim Black is Cahoots operations coordinator. We handle almost 20% of the entire external public safety call volume for, for our area. Cahoots team members are trained to de-escalate when responding to a mental health crisis. Thank you guys so much. A recent study found 25 to 50 percent of fatal officer involved shootings involve someone with a severe mental illness. Eugene's police chief, Chris Skinner. They don't need jail. What they need is they need to be able to be de-escalated from their crisis. They need a ride to a mental health facility or to a medical care facility or wrapped around with services. That's what the people need. They don't need to be going to jail every time. In Denver, the program is called STAR and it's relatively new, but it's been doing very well in the community. What are the range of calls that you're seeing? Mental health, substance sure, misuse, but really um, any self-identified crisis. You know, we could go to that and handle that more appropriately than an officer. Instead of sending armed police officers, 911 dispatchers can send Carly and Chase to low-risk calls. There's a reason, Chase, that you're dressed like this. Our goal was to try to look less threatening and to more like a community resource, and so more of a community paramedic feel. It's a basic thing, but does it help to be in jeans when you approach someone? Oh, absolutely. You want to look approachable. You want people to feel comfortable. And I think this is a good first step because it takes away some of the pressure off of the police force, and it's just showing the community that their needs matter and need to be met. Another example is in Florida, in Miami-Dade County, they put a tax on the restaurants and they use the proceeds to help move the homeless into shelters and then later on into permanent housing. The Defund the Police movement started in Minneapolis, which is where George Floyd was murdered by a police officer. About 80% of that police force does not live in Minneapolis. Yeah. Their city council actually granted them another $500,000 to bring in police officers from the surrounding area outside the city in the city to police it. And they're being allocated about $180 million for the police force. Like, what do they need that money for? If you ask me, in my perfect world, what needs to be done to get rid of over-militarization in America and gun violence, I would prefer to say, just ban all the guns, destroy them all, don't build any more. Or if I can't have that, then put in laws saying most people are not allowed to be registered for guns. Ban the promotion of guns ban Nerf guns, ban Call of Duty games like that, ban shooter games. Kids should not be used to the thought of killing other people and being just okay with it, even if they know that it's just a video game. They're being heavily desensitized to the idea of murder and it scares me. They need to specialize the police forces that so that each unit is focused on one specific task, like traffic, surveillance, home invasions, and only the ones that deal with the most violent criminals and people in society should be allowed to have guns. People that are doing traffic stops should not have guns whatsoever. I train them well when they start and then every about three or four months just to make sure that their mental psychological health is still on track. Do a lot of psychological testing on them, anti-bias, anti-racism, anti-prejudice training. Do what they did in Germany, have them personally speak to descendants of slaves or people that were targeted by the KKK. Learn about the communities that you're protecting. Have empathy and respect them. See civilians as human beings instead of targets. The best case scenario would be to only hire police officers that live in the community that they're gonna be working in and have the demographics of that police force reflect that of the community. So say the community is 80% black and the rest is white, have majority of the police force be black and the rest white, because you need to understand the needs of that community, the struggles of that community and where they're coming from mentally and emotionally in order to be able to 
keep them safe. Like, same as if there's a big Muslim population in that community, the police force should also, a lot of it should be Muslim, have actual legitimate life sentences for the officers that commit murder. All in all, I do think that defunding the police would be a good idea if you're taking a portion of the funding that goes to police and spreading that out to preventative measures and different kinds of first responders, putting money into education, housing, jobs for people in impoverished communities, getting people free counseling, free therapy, free healthcare, I think even would help, honestly. Because when people are doing well mentally, financially, psychologically, they have no reason to commit crime. They have no reason to go into somebody's home and take their things. When they're seeing a counselor or a therapist, they're working through their mental and psychological traumas and issues. They have no reason to go out and rape somebody or to touch kids or harm any other person. They understand that if something bad happens, they can go to rehabilitation, they can get back on track. And at that point, there would hardly even be a, a need for the police. In America, there seems to be this focus on punishment and what to do after something bad happens, even in the healthcare system also, because they profit from it. These prisons profit off it, these big medical industry companies profit, profit off of it. And I really think that we need to start focusing on preventative measures rather than what do we do after it's already too late.